Here we go. Cool. We're off to the races. Cool. Um, so Jeff Levine, I'm curious, I guess my first question for you is uh, Fake Up. Where did the name come from? You're now using, it was your creative consultancy, or your not creative consultancy, but agency. And, and now it is your, your crypto name. Where did the name come from? Yeah, um, so I, I kind of started um, in the late 90s, early 2000s in the interactive space. And at that point, everyone was coming up with crazy and unique names for their portfolios or for their companies and just a way to kind of, you know, represent themselves. And growing up, I had um, a friend who always called makeup fake up. And it just kind of stuck with me. So um, yeah, when I got a little older, um, I kind of reminisced back and yeah, it's kind of, it's stuck. And yeah, to your point, it kind of started off as my portfolio name. And then I opened up a small production company for a number of years. And then when I went back to working for um, people again, um, it kind of reverted back to my portfolio. And now, yeah, it's kind Kind of just stuck with me for the last 23 24 years that's cool um yeah i have a there are a couple words from my childhood that stick out in my <laughs> mind and i use them whenever i can uh, one is zorn bin my uh my my mom's side of the family for whatever reason would call uh rolling garbage cans zorn bins <laughs> and um and it's just stuck with me <laughs> Um, so you kind of briefly touched upon your your pre NFT life. Maybe you can uh, give our listeners and readers a uh, a little more detail into where you what you were doing before crypto and what you've been doing outside of crypto since you entered the space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I said, I, I kind of um, I got into the interactive industry advertising in. 2000 2001 so at that time it was you know the time that flash was coming out and everyone was doing these crazy interactive um, websites so i kind of uh, dove into that as a designer and then moved my way up to an art director and kind of um you know just bouncing around from different studios and agencies um in new york which i'm originally from um, new york um, and yeah, I just kind of branched out on my own and started freelancing and then, you know, doing the same kind of interactive sites and games and, you know, experiences. And that kind of snowballed into a small production company, which I ran um, in New York for four or five years. Um, and then I kind of closed um, that company and then I moved out to L.A., and since being out here in LA, I kind of continued in that same, um, you know, kind of realm of working with agencies and production companies on, you know, larger interactive experiences, whether they're sites, games, um, things like that, AR, VR. And then for the last probably seven or eight years of my commercial career, it's been more experiential. So um, playing around with different installations and kind of bridging that gap between the, the digital screen, physical space, and also sensor-based, um, you know, technologies. So I do a lot of um, concept development and um, creative work for, yeah, ex uh, experiential things like auto shows, tech conferences, um, you know, experiences at large music festivals um, and things like that. So that's kind of the, the commercial side of things, which, yeah, I've been doing that for the last, like, 21, 22 years. Um, and I continue to do that as kind of my um, commercial side of things. But then um, about three or four years ago, I got kind of um, introduced into kind of the NFT space or the very early stages of that. And like most creatives, um, you know, I, I had my, my day job, my commercial work, but I was always um, tinkering around with different things, whether it was AR, VR, or 3D, or just doing my own designs and things like that. And I would always, you know, post those on Twitter and Instagram and, you know, dribble and other, you know, kind of platforms. But I never really saw that as an avenue to, you know, start being an, an artist or, you know, however you want to kind of um, phrase that. But then the NFT space kind of started to open up and my eyes started to open up too, where here's a platform and, and kind of here's an ecosystem and here's a, a technology where I can kind of take those things that I've been creating on the side and my own kind of creative experiments and ideas that don't necessarily fit into, you know, a large brand or something on my um 
um, commercial side of work, and I could actually, you know, take those and present those to people and, you know, maybe start, you know, selling work or being more of kind of a independent, you know, digital um, kind of creator. And just like earlier in my career, it just kind of started to snowball. And yeah, over the last three or four years, it's definitely kind of grown to a place where I'm, you know, have opportunities like, like these, you know, like we're talking here. Um, but yeah, just kind of, I'm continuing on my commercial side of work because that, that still pays the bills. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely progressing and, and creating more work and learning new things and yeah, just continuing that journey of creation and exploration. Very cool. I definitely want to ask some questions about experiential, but first I want to talk more directly about the art that you've been, you've been um, minting. Uh, the first is I, I really, the first work that, of yours that really stood out to me were your dot pieces. They're, they kind of remind me of like a pop art sculptor using dip and dots ice cream. Um, how did you arrive at this style? What were, what were, what was the tinkering like? Yeah, that, I mean, it, it's, it's inter interesting you say that because that, that's definitely, um, you know, my style. I, I would say it's more pop art and sculpture um, based. And you see that with kind of the dot stuff I do, but also with the Grenady stuff I do. But with the, the dot stuff, um, it, it, was, it came out of a lot of um, experimentation. And I wanted to kind of create my own characters, my own scenarios. And again, leaning into kind of the, the pop culture side of things, I wanted to create things that resonated with people on that pop culture side, but then kind of put my own spin on it. And yeah, it was just really a, a, a big exploration um, with that. And I, I think the biggest thing with the dot stuff I do is um, a lot of the characters that I use, they have to have like a, a strong silhouette and a strong color palette. And it's it's really important to kind of nail um, that silhouette and that color palette because that's what people resonate with. So if I'm doing something like Mickey Mouse, their their silhouette is, is very iconic, but also the color palette is iconic. So when you kind of take the dot style that I have and you create something like Mickey Mouse with that, you need to make sure that you have that silhouette intact and the colors, because if you just look at a bunch of dots, you know, in sculpture form, it's sometimes kind of hard to see, you know, what that is or what you're trying to convey. But once you add that strong silhouette and even more importantly, that color palette, that's what really resonates um, with people. And that's how you kind of make that connection, because a lot of the stuff is sculpture based, but I also kind of throw in a little bit of abstractism um, as well. Um, and the interesting thing with the dots is I've developed kind of um, a workflow or a pipeline to basically take um, a 3D model that I create, whether it's Mickey Mouse, Homer Simpson, whatever the character or subject matter is, and then I break it into kind of its um, parts and pieces and those main silhouette kind of um, shells. And then I run a simulation where all the dots then are kind of um, building those different components. And once I have this big sculpture of all these millions of dots, then I go in by hand and I start to manipulate and move and, you know, add things here, add things there to really build out those silhouettes and those lines. And then the last thing is um, coming in um, with the coloring and, and the shading and the texturing um, of all of those elements and making sure that it's kind of adhering to whatever pop culture icon, um, you know, I'm, I'm working with to make that real concrete um, kind of connection. Are there any pop culture icons that you have wanted to do a, a dot sculpture of, but you find they don't have the color palette or silhouette that would be conducive to it? Yeah, it, it's it's funny because I, I, I have a notebook of so many different ideas of how I want to do something and what I want to do something. And yeah, it, it's, 
it has to be the right character, but it also, the, the character or the object has to be very popular in culture, meaning a lot of people need to kind of either see the shape or see the color and kind of automatically know, you know, what it is. And I think a really good example of it is I've tried doing my Grenady character as a dot um, sculpture. And yes, it, it looks correct, but the Grenady character isn't so inserted in pop culture where everyone knows about it and you know knows the color palette it just starts to kind of fall apart whereas if you do like mickey mouse or homer simpson those shapes those colors um you know kind of resonate with people just because they grew up watching it and you know seeing cartoons and and whatnot so yeah there there are a lot of things that work but then there are a lot of things that don't work um and it's just kind of trying to find that balance really and also trying to figure out like what I want to do creatively and kind of what different things you know I want to explore but yeah to your to your point not not, not everything um works where did grenady come from <laughs> um I don't, Grenady has been something that's been in the back of my mind for quite a while. I've, I've always wanted to kind of create my own character. Um, again, growing up in the, the, you know, eighties and the nineties and starting my career in the very early two thousands, um, vinyl toys and designer toys were a big thing and they, they, they still are a big thing. Um, so I, I kind of grew up on that culture and I really liked how the, the, the characters and just the structure and sometimes the simplicity of those vinyl toys kind of, um, you know, come out from a design standpoint. So yeah, it's just been something that I've had in the back of my mind that I've wanted to do for a long time. And a couple of years ago, I was tinkering around um, with different um, like body shapes and things like that. And I kind of landed on um, a, a pineapple grenade just because it is kind of iconic in its shape and everyone kind of knows what that is. And then kind of sticking on your traditional cartoon arms, um, legs, you know, feet and hand. And yeah, it's it's interesting because it's it's a very open palette for me to kind of play with. I don't really have a lot of constraints with it, which I like. Obviously, the character shape and its silhouette remains the same but i can do pieces or a collection that is more pop driven i can do something that's more politically driven or you know anything else it's what i like about it like i said is it's a very open canvas and i kind of get to explore a lot of different things within one kind of medium or one character that is kind of the the through thread that connects all of the the grenady um you know pieces together Oh no, did you freeze? Oh. Oh, you froze for a bit. Oh, sorry. He said one character who is you're experimenting, sorry, you're experimenting with that's kind of where I lost you. You were experimenting with one character who is kind of I guess just an open open canvas. Yeah, yeah. Grenady is is kind of a character which has a very open canvas where I can explore a lot of different things creatively, whether that's conceptual and it's pop culture or political, but also I'm able to kind of explore thing, different things visually um, as well. So it's just very wide open. Um, and the one thing that does connect all of those pieces is you know grenady himself which is that through thread um throughout all of all of the work in that kind of larger um body of work do you have any lore or background information on grenady or is he just that that blank canvas he yeah he's he's definitely that that blank canvas he doesn't really have a backstory and i think i did that subconsciously to keep the the canvas wide open to kind of explore and do whatever I want, um, you know, um, with him. Um, but yeah, no, no backstory. And I don't, I don't know if I ever will. I like the idea that it's a little more ominous and it's just a lot more, you know, wide open. Yeah. I like that too. Um, what are your wildest ambitions with Grenady? <laughs> um, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, I, a lot of my work and whether it's the dot stuff or, or Grenady, if you look at it, it does come across more as sculptures, you know, kind of in, um, 
in a digital form in, you know, kind of a digital environment. But my, I'll, I'll give you a smaller goal and I'll give you a really big goal. So the smaller goal is um, I would love to do Grenady as an actual um, vinyl um, toy. Um, I have done Grenady as a resin 3D printed kind of toy. Um, and those look really cool. I, I can send you some, some photos of those, but they're, they're very fragile. They're very brittle. But um, in the next year or so, I would like to release Grenady as a legitimate, um, you know, vinyl um, toy. That's the smaller kind of goal. The larger, crazier kind of goal is I would love to do like some very large sculptures of Grenady in the three, four, five foot kind of um, scale. Just thinking like walking into, you know, a nice, beautiful space and just having a massive, you know, Grenady there would be very, very interesting from a purely kind of visual, um, you know, standpoint. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the drop that's coming up? Yeah. So the, the drop that's coming up is, is another really cool one. Um, it's, it's Grenady based, but it was really kind of focused around, um, skate decks and, you know, growing up in New York, I, I was, you know, skated as a kid and, you know, I grew up in the, the New York hardcore scene. So a lot of my friends and the, the music and kind of the culture I grew up in was very, you know, skateboard and kind of music oriented. So skate culture, skate graphics are, you know, definitely a big um, background of mine. So, so for this release, I really wanted to take Grenady and put him on a skate deck and not a skate deck that would, you know, someone actually use. It's more in the, the sense of a piece of art that people can hang, um, you know, on their walls. And I think an, another thing is with all my work moving forward, I want all my digital work to have a physical component, whether it's a skate deck or a print or a canvas or clothing, whatever it might be. I want to make sure that there's always a physical element with it. So this drop is the the first obviously, you know, moving forward as well, but this will be the first one that has a very large um, physical component. So each di digital piece will have a print, but then there's also um, four uh, one of one physical decks um, that are in the collection um, as well, which, which are really cool. I'm, I'm really excited about these. Um, so the, the, the backside of the deck has a printed graphic of Grenady kind of in a, in a large space, kind of akin to his sculptured, you know, version. Um, and then on the reverse side of the deck, um, engraved on it is, you know, the Grenady kind of um, logo, um, the drop information and some other um, stuff. So it's, it's a really cool piece to kind of hang and showcase, um, you know, on your wall. Very cool. Yeah. I've seen them and, uh, I'm using this new software, I'm hoping I can put in the video, add these in as as we're talking. Um, but I'm really excited about this drop. I'm I'm hoping to get get one. Um, maybe not the physical. I don't know if my wife will let me go into a bidding <laughs> war uh, at this point. But um, I'd like to go back to your your uh, non crypto career and. Um, you, you know, you've, you've worked in VR, AR, experiential, interactive. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your more recent experiences in these mediums? I think it's, I mean, it's a fascinating area to work in. And I think, you know, as a digital art appreciator, um, I'm super interested in these. And I think a lot of other digital artists are, are exploring these mediums. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the commercial work I do, like I was saying earlier, probably the last seven or eight years has been experiential. And experiential is such a, a large kind of term, but it does really kind of blanket, you know, everything from touch screens in physical space to AR and VR experiences in physical space, as well as using um sensors in physical space. So like think of like a trip wire or a pressure sensitive pad on a floor, um, you know, th things like that and kind of interconnecting um, all of them. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the cooler projects I've done over the last couple of years is I think it was 2019 LA auto show working with um, 
working with Nissan, we basically, uh, they were releasing a new car that had a lot of different um, sensor technologies that it could detect different things as it was, you know, driving or trying to park itself and trying to assist and uh, moving from lanes, you know, in traffic and things like that. So the the cool thing that we did was we we took one of these physical cars and put it um, in the middle of the LA Auto Show um, kind of footprint for the um, for the event and around um, the vehicle. We had um, a circle that was essentially a, a track, and on that track was a large. Um, think 60 or 70 inch screen and you could basically take this screen and physically move it around the car 360 degrees but as you're moving it around the car when you hit um, certain points on that track on the screen we would augment in different features so through the screen that you're moving around you are seeing the physical car in the space but then you're also seeing the augmented animation and graphics on the screen so it, it's a cool it's 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 a cool system to kind of highlight the unseen, right? Like you can't see these sensors in real life because they're all you know invisible and things like that. But when you are moving around with this large screen, you can kind of see the invisible, which is, you know, it's it's a marketing ploy, you know, obviously trying to sell cars, but from a creative and a technical standpoint, it's kind of cool mixing that physicality of the actual vehicle in the space, the screen, the ability to move it around, but then using um, AR and animation in that space, you can kind of tell these different stories in a very kind of interesting medium. And you're also actively pulling kind of the user into that as they're moving around and kind of, you know, learning and exploring. That's really cool. That's, um, I guess, one of my points of not frustration, but where I feel like the crypto art world is is lacking compared to the traditional art world, and and um, also where where big brands kind of are are leading a lot of innovation is that there's not this you know with NFTs there's the single piece there's not even to my knowledge ways to buy like a diptych or a triptych let alone to experience some some larger more ambitious thing maybe that'll change when ar glasses and vr goggles become uh more prevalent uh, which is that actually leads into my next question um which is around the future of ar and i think that this will probably be a big thing for for nfts and i'm curious to know if you have any insight since you have worked in ar as to um what what you see coming down down the pike in the next one or two years yeah i mean i think um the ar and the, and the vr spaces is, is interesting it's definitely come a long way i think um the 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 biggest hurdle i think it well there's there's a lot, but I guess the, the two biggest are the, the first one is um, the processing power. You know, um, a lot of um, devices aren't really able to process high polygon counts, high um, high textures and things like that. So the, the visual fidelity of stuff when you're in uh, AR and even VR is it's it's lackluster i i would say at this point it's definitely getting better um there are technologies that um unreal are coming out with where you can basically um stream those assets over a, um kind of a like a like a video um line so you're not uh unloading all of that processing on your phone or on a computer or on a headset you're basically just streaming it from a massively you know powerful computer elsewhere so i think um streaming uh content and experiences is gonna is gonna help that a lot but also um one of the bigger things is is and at least what i found um using this in the commercial space is people aren't really into going to a physical space and putting on, you know, a, a big headset and kind of interacting with things. It's, it's a large ask to get someone to do that. Um, and when COVID came around, that became an even bigger um, issue. So um, a lot of times we're trying to take those crazy experiences and put them back onto the actual user's phone, um, you know, th themselves so that they can move around and, and kind of experience things. So I think once we get over that hurdle of figuring out what's an easy, lightweight, simplified headset to wear, that, that'll help immensely. But then also 
figuring out how can we take all of this great content that we can create on a computer that's high fidelity, you know, great looking from a render um, perspective and still render that in real time, but stream it to someone's, you know, device. I think once we figure those two things out, I think a lot, a lot will um, unlock. And it's, it's funny because before we hopped on here, I was watching a, um, a video on YouTube talking about like possible leaks for the next um, uh, Apple developer conference in June. And they're, they're saying that it might be the time that Apple does come out with their headset. And I think that's the other component is, you know, when the iPhone came out, that was kind of almost an industry standard, you know, device that everyone wanted or everyone has to kind of create those experiences around. So this could be one of those moments too, where if Apple does come out with the headset and they do it right, and it's at a right price point, once mass adoption kind of takes over, then that'll greatly help kind of the evolution or the ability to kind of push, you know, those mediums um, further at a higher quality. Yeah, that's literally in the written question asking about uh, Apple VR glasses and and if it will make the the culture shift that the iPhone did. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, in, inclusive of AR, but what I, I kind of technologies and and ideas are you most excited about when it comes to the future of digital art? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the AR, the VRs is definitely interesting. I mean, I, th I think the explosion of AI um, right now is, is interesting, but I, a lot of people aren't using it the right way. They're just, you know, punching in, you know, a bunch of keywords, key phrases, and it, and it, you know, it kicks out a really interesting visual, but I think you're going to see kind of what happened with the explosion of NFTs in the early days that when NFTs first came out, anyone that had Photoshop was knocking out work and they thought that was great work that's, you know, out there. And there, there was no concept there, there was no heart or soul kind of in that work. And I kind of see that right now with AI where a lot of people are just, you know, kind of punching in some things and kicking out cool, pretty pictures, which is good. But when people start actually using it as a, a tool and not necessarily the final outcome medium, I think that's going to um, affect things um, greatly. I also think that uh, I, uh, Adobe is starting to integrate it into their products, but I think once it gets to a point where it's kind of streamlined, I think creators and people are going to be able to come up with crazier, cooler, more interesting ideas and actually be able to kind of produce them at a quality that they want. Because right now, and I can you know, kind of speak this from my own experiences, I can have a crazy great concept idea that I want to do, but I'm kind of limited to my, my skill set, right? Of, of how can, can I create that to the quality that I want? And if it doesn't meet my quality expectations and I would never, you know, kind of release that. So I, I think there's going to be exponential growth in the quality of work that's coming out from, from smaller teams, right? From like the, the, the one person shop or the two person shop. And it's just going to make the work a lot more interesting, but also come, come at a better um, quality. Have you experimented with AI? Yeah, I, I use it quite often. Um, it, it's funny. I'm, um, I'm working on a smaller collection right now with the dot stuff I do. And it's, um, more architectural based where the the sculpture is in more of a like modern kind of um, museum type of setting and for all of those uh, background concepts i've actually used midjourney to kind of photo bash um, environments and you know kind of use that to create the environment but I used it in a way which, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think is the right way where you're using the AI to kind of help you create concept work and then you take that and actually produce it. So I use, um, you know, mid journey to create kind of the, the concept sketch, let's call it. And then I take that and then I go into Cinema 4D and I actually build out, um, you know, the actual environment. And as I'm going through that kind of building process, you find out it's like, oh, hey, the stairs in my concept that came from AI doesn't really work in a 3D space or I want to add this or change this, but it's it's more about using that AI concept um, kind of art as actual 
concept art and not necessarily just kicking that out and throwing it in the background and saying, you know, it's a done deal. It's just using it as a tool in the process for the creation of what the work is going to be um, at the end. Mm -hmm. Which artists have had the biggest impact on your work? Um, wow. I mean, I would say G monk cause uh, me and G monk have a very similar background cause we kind of came up around the same time and we've actually worked with a lot of the same companies kind of in the advertising, um, you know, digital production kind of space. So he's, he's had a heavily impact on me. Um, earlier in my career, I worked with a lot of smaller studio. Well, they were small at the time, but Roken, um, was a, a big influence on me and all the kind of founders of that company. Um, yeah, I would say G Monk, Roken, um, ID Society, who I worked with early on. Um, Matt Gondek is a big um, kind of um, you know person to me. Again, we're we're similar ages, but I think his, his work really resonates with me, and I think you can see a lot of my dot stuff kind of does pull inspiration from that more pop culture type of um, stuff. Uh, Ron English is is another big one. Um, yeah. Uh, I like Pac a lot too. He's definitely not. Um, he's definitely not on the the pop culture side of things from a visual perspective. But I think uh, at least his earlier work was very interesting with the way that he was um, playing with and manipulating um, the blockchain and, and doing some interesting things there. Um, yeah, I would I would say that kind of core group. Well, did you see Matt Gondek's bat drop that he did with us? Yes. Yeah, that was very, very cool. I, I follow him on, on, on Instagram and things like that. So I, I kind of saw his creation process for that, too. And that was that was really cool, um, the way that he did that. And the, the way they came out is, um, yeah, they, they came out really, really nice. Yeah. I wish I would have had the scratch for one of those. They're really nice. <laughs> what do you do outside of art? What are your passions, hobbies? What yeah. are you into? Yeah, I as an East Coast kid, uh I played hockey growing up and I've I've continued to play hockey. So I've I've played ice hockey for the last 30 plus years. So uh I'm a, I'm a lot older now. Um but yeah, I, I still play twice a week, sometimes three times a week. So yeah, if I'm not working, which is a lot of my time, I'm either playing hockey or hanging out with my wife, um you know, dinner, drinks, enjoying the the California weather. Um I have two French bulldogs, which are crazy. So they, they occupy quite a bit of my time. Um, but yeah, I mean, work, I would say takes up probably 85% of my time, which is a good thing and a bad thing, but yeah, kind of is what it is. If you could collaborate with one artist, who would it be? Oh, wow. Um, hmm. I think I would have to probably say Matt Gondek. Um, I think that could be really interesting. Um, yeah, I would say him. You know, it's interesting. Your Grenady project reminds me a lot of another Maker's Place artist, uh, Original Plan, who does a bear brick. And he uses the bear brick as a blank canvas that he not only uses for his own iterations, but he hands it out. Uh, two different artists, and he's done dozens, if not hundreds of collaborations uh, with different artists who just use Grenady in the same way, or they use the bare brick in, in the same way he does, and the same way you use uh, Grenady. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I do actually know who you're talking of. I, it took me a second there. But yeah, the, but that's the thing. It's like, it, it, it harkens back to the, the early days, like I was talking about earlier with, the, with the, the vinyl toys is like, you know, Kid Robot, you know, and all these other, you know, um, My Plastic Heart. Um, and even super plat, you know, they, they produce kind of their staple characters, but then they also create like a DIY version of that for other, you know, creatives to kind of, you know, rift on and, and create their own stuff, which is, which is very cool. Um, and I'm, that's the idea that I'm kind of playing with as part of kind of the Grenady, you know, vinyl um, toy. One part of it being like DIY kind of, you know, clean canvas. And then the other side, you know, being more, conceptual based like pieces and things like that but but yeah i i like that a lot and that's kind of the the stuff that i grew up on too is like being able to customize these cool things 
with not a lot of with not a lot of red tape around you know things when it comes to legality and IP and all all that stuff. Right. If you could give your twenty year old self any advice on creativity, what would you say? Um, <laughs> I would say don't be afraid to share your personal work and put more emphasis on your personal work. Obviously you need to pay the bills and you know, you, you need to, you know, do that side of things with your commercial work. But I would say continue to push your own work because it's, it's important for you from a creative standpoint, just to keep your own, you know, sanity, but it's, it's also important to kind of, make your own stuff and not be afraid to put it out there because I, I would be afraid earlier in my career and, and even now to put stuff out there if, if people didn't, you know, like it or didn't resonate. And I've kind of shedded kind of that, that coat, I think in a way. And yeah, I would just say do more personal work and, and share it out in the world. Cool. Yeah. That's good advice. Um, Speaking of personal work, can you let our readers know where they can learn more about you and your work? Yeah, uh, my my Instagram is is probably the most active where I, I post um, stuff I'm working on or finished work. That's just fake up, F A K E U P. Um, same thing on Twitter. I post a lot on there. But then, yeah, if you want to see my commercial work or any of the collections I've uh, released, that's uh, fakeup.net, F-A-K-E-U-P.net. Um, yeah, all my stuff's up there. Well, and Grenady has uh, his own Grenady, URL too, right? Yep, Grenady, uh, net. Um, and yes, Grenady is spelled wrong. I spelled it uh, phonetically, which I think is more interesting, but that's probably another conversation for how bad of a speller I am. But I think at the end, it, uh, it worked out okay. Yeah, it's G-E-R-N-A-D-Y, right? Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, um, Jeff slash fake up, it has been excellent getting to know you and, and learning more about all your all your projects. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm stoked to kind of see what's what's next.